Sudan's Allen's work is founded in traditional watercolor, but in recent years she has explored the boundaries of all water media and its alluring spontaneity. The result of this experimental approach is often abstract and uniquely original. Sue received her BFA at University of Utah in 1980 and has been painting and teaching the nature of water media ever since. She is a consistent award winner and was proud to be awarded signature status in the National Watercolor Society in 2011. In 2013, Sue has a painting included in the American Watercolor Society 146th International Exhibition. She achieved signature status in Southern Watercolor Society this year. She was featured in Watercolor Magic Magazine December 2005. Sue is a signature member and past president of Florida Watercolor Society, a member and past president of Brandon League of Fine Arts, and she served as a professional advisor to the Hillsborough County Florida Art for Public Places Committee. She has lived and exhibited her work in Europe and many states, including Alaska, and now lives and works in Lithia, Florida, near Tampa. Um, and I will say Sue is a very generous teacher, and if you ever get a chance to take a class from her, it's wonderful. Thank you, Diane. That was nice. I see some faces in here I recognize. It's good to see you. Um, okay, do I need to speak up or turn the, temp the volume up? You say that like it's easy, right? Okay, is this better? Better? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yes, this is letting go with water media because I've been working a lot in acrylic as well as watercolor in recent years. And I'm trying to stay with watercolor for you today because most of you work in watercolor. Plus, I would like to get back to the transparencies I've had before. And acrylic makes a strong statement, but it doesn't necessarily say um, the, beautiful, the beautiful things that the transparency does for us. I think that's why we're all doing watercolor, is those unique things that it can do. Um, hold on a minute. I have a lesson plan. <laughs> and I left it back there. You probably would like me to know what I'm doing. Um, I want, you to let, I want you to learn to let go and appreciate the things that watercolor will do. And I'm going to demonstrate that in a simple exercise. And I think you all know this, but you may not use it. Um, when I went, I left high school in six, 1965 and went to the university, and everything was abstract. Everything was abstract. Expressionism, you might as well not even be there if, if you were going to paint traditional or you were going to paint tight, is what they always called it in those days. So I learned my first drawing design class. I walked in, and I was so eager. You know, I was going to hit it hard. And the teacher had piled a bunch of bricks in the middle of the room. So it was just shapes. Bricks were standing up. Bricks were laying down. It was an assortment of shapes and sizes and all sorts of things like this. And if you, I thought, well, what am I going to do with that? I just came from, my high school teacher was an illustrator. So he wanted me to do illustrations. He would give us a title, like night football was one of them, I remember. And um, I was supposed to do an illustration to show that. So I was used to uh, a direction which sometimes this kind of painting does not have. This teacher wanted me to just go and make something out of those bricks that he had never seen before. Now, I'm saying all this so you realize where, I'm, where I was coming from. Um, not only that, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. I lived in Canton until I was nine, but we moved to Cleveland, and I had summer classes at the Cleveland Art Museum, I had, and one summer, I had a watercolor class at the Cleveland Institute of Art, which 
was such a blessing. You know now because a lot of kids do classes like that where they go to a, a university for in the summer. But the art teacher I had for watercolor was not doing traditional watercolor. She was making beautiful, splashy things. And then not too long after that, there was a show at the Cleveland Museum that showed Van Gogh. And I got this in my head that I didn't have to make things look just like what they were. I could make them whatever I wanted them to be. And if you were here last night, you heard Mark, say, Mark Mahaffey say several times, and he's one of my heroes, um, I make it my own. You can do whatever you want. And so here's my bricks. I'm just going to show you quickly some of the things that I love, and I want you to let go like, like I try to do as well. And you can start almost anywhere, you know. Of course, you all know about wet in wet. And I'm just using this as a grid to kind of get started with an abstract. How many do abstract already? OK, you're scaring me, but <laughs> I'll look at yours later. We're going to talk about mine, I guess, now. Um, <laughs> I'm going to start with a color here. And I think I want to start with sort of a gray, so I'm going to mix a color. A little bit of cerulean blue. It's going to gray it out a little bit, take it to sort of a taupe color. And I'm just going to put the paint on loosely, like this. And I'm already on a wet surface. So see, it all blends for me. It gets interesting. For me, it gets interesting right away. I also am a fan of um, Morton Salberg. Some of you might have taken his class like I did. And you know, I just have to do that, because that's what Mort would do. He would hit it like that. If you do these things to start, then you're not scared of the white paper anymore. It just takes you in another place. But remember, I'm doing bricks. So I'll try to use some more techniques that you all will recognize, I think. Paper towels. Um, so already, we have something I really like. <laughs> but I'm not, happy, I'm not happy with my work unless I do this kind of thing. If I get too tight, then I want to throw it in the trash, because I, I can't. It makes my teeth hurt, almost. But that's because it's mine. Um, I can appreciate it when someone else does it. I think it's fantastic. And I, you know, there's no doubt I, I judge shows for people. And I choose realistic stuff all the time, because I'm just astounded by what they have accomplished. You know, We all feel that way. I'm going to pull out some color, I mean, some lines from these wet shapes I have, just to carry it across. And then you know you can use um, the bleeding technique, where you just put a little water along it while it's still wet, and pull it out. And that gives it a lot of movement. I'm going to add a little more blue in here the blue I've already, I'm already using. I like to stick at the beginning to colors that, um, like I mixed two colors for the first one, and now I, I'm kind of going to stick to those colors for a little while, just till I get myself established here. I want some whites, so I'll leave, I'll paint in some firm edges like that to keep white shapes. That's part of my composition now. I have to consider that, of course. And speaking of composition, and um, I do abide by the rules of um, design. And I have a list here. You all know them. But your composition, you have to consider. And that just means finding a balance within your work. Your format, I'm in a vertical format on a full sheet of watercolor paper. I could have changed that format to any shape I wanted. And I studied with Nicholas Simmons, too. So I will tell you, he says to everybody, don't have a paper that's the same as everyone else's. Has anybody been in Nick's class? He, he, um, he says, if, if I'm going through an art show and everybody has a full sheet or a half sheet, if somebody gives me a square, it stops me and makes me look at it. So. You may not, at this point, be thinking about competing all the time, but I sort of think of that a lot. So I try to consider my format. Is it interesting? And am I relating to the exterior of my paper as one of my design elements? You have to think about where the paper ends. And consider that with all your, everything you do, it, it's confined in this space. It will have a mat around it, but I still have to consider it. That's format. Shapes. Um, 
Right now I have a bunch of small shapes and a backwash that I don't like. Um, but shapes, if you get some bigger shapes in at some point, which I'm, I get hung up on all these pretty little things. But, um, okay, I'll get a big shape in there. How about that? Shapes, value structure, you know, right now it's all mid-tone. Don't ever just leave it mid-tone. It's the, it's like the death knell for um, competition or almost this, the same thing is true with customers. When you put paintings up in any show and you don't consider um, the same things that a judge would consider, you want to draw the person to stop. You want them to look at your painting and think about it. And you don't have subject matter when you're doing an abstract. You don't have a subject matter to draw them in. Subject ma I've, I've judged the state fair, and I was with a woman who actually said, well, I like the Cocker Spaniel because it's so cute. But it wasn't the best painting, you understand. She was drawn in by the emotion of the subject. When you do an abstract, you don't have that ability. You have to, you have to give them something else. And for me, it's usually, I think, whoops, sorry, I forgot that was there. Um, for me, it's usually something like a familiar feel of the design. If you get it balanced right and people feel it, that it's, it's good. It's amazing how there is a constant to that. There's a certain quality that everybody understands, sort of. We've all in, agreed that that is balanced and that's the form it should be. If you've ever put things on your coffee table and someone moved one, and you go, that's not right. Okay, that's the way I paint. I react to if I do something that's incorrect. And you probably do that in your paintings, too. You immediately know if you did something incorrect and it feels uncomfortable, right? or if you arrange your magazines wrong on your coffee table, you feel that way. So trust yourself on that. Trust yourself on all of it. I've had people say to me, well, Sue, how do you, how do you get so confident about it? It's not really confidence. It's arrogance, sort of. It's like, I only have to make myself happy, right? But I hope that it makes others feel what I feel. I think all artists have that a little bit. I'm really sensitive I, to everybody else's opinion, but I, um, I have to do what's right for me. So if you don't have that, you kind of get lost because there's so much going on. OK, I'm talking too much. Um, just a couple more things. Color, of course, is important, and focal point. Now, I don't decide on my focal point until the very end when the painting is nearly finished. So does this still look like a heck of a thing of bricks? I would come in and put a second coat here in a couple places for a subtle shift. Let me get it a little darker. This time I'm putting Antwerp blue in it, which is a Windsor Newton color. Oh dear, didn't mix it well. So I'm going to, even though it was drawn kind of cattywampus here, I'm doing it that way so that it will have an interesting shape. And I'm going to carry that color on a, let it do what we call lost and found, get it to there, and then bring the line on over. And then to continue that thought, I'll probably put a little dark right here. So I was thinking before I came, of course, about what would help you get into it, and sometimes in, into abstraction, and you face this blank page, and it's like, oh, geez, I don't have a clue. What am I supposed to do with that? Um, maybe you do, but in my classes, I usually hear from people like, what do I do next, Sue? I don't know what to do. Um, so that's why I wanted to start with something simple. The techniques I use are, um, you know, the same ones that everybody uses. You can pull the paint by putting water next to it. Of course, it moves. You can lift. If I lift it like that, can you see? Or should I turn it this way? I love drips. You will see, where's my red one? There, the, um, that's called Shangri-La. 
And it's actually on Canvas, but um, see, I love just interrupting everything and doing something like that. But this is the first step. There's going to be three or four layers, so don't judge me too much yet. <laughs> it's like you don't want anybody to come in and taste the soup until you get it done. OK. You can talk to me while I'm painting if you want to. I'm not real picky, but. When I was in oil painting classes, and I, I did have to take them, of course, to get a degree, a lot of life study, um, my preliminary drawing in, we would paint, we would do our sketch with oil paint on the canvas after we'd primed, after we put an under color, uh, what's that called, background color? Um, Anyway, they were all drippy, like I, you know, you'd be painting with oil and, and it was wet and it would drip down and I'd get these washes going just like in watercolor. And I hadn't studied watercolor yet, so I know that that's my natural tendency is to want to let it go a little bit. Um, but oil doesn't do it for me because you can't finish the painting with just a wash. You have to go back in and do all the detail and, and tighten it up and it becomes flatter. So, I, and another thing I love to do is lifting. Do you see how I keep coming in and getting my lights back as I work? This one here is ready for a drip. I think this needs a drip. And it's, you can tell when it gets to semi-gloss, kind of semi, wet that it's ready to, if you, if you use, a, use a drip through that, see it'll stay. And it's, it's a trick, I mean it's a gimmick, but somehow it's satisfying, I think it's a, it's a nice gimmick. So, okay I'm working in the middle, let me get something big going. Um, if you, some of you have seen my work in recent years, you're probably thinking this is a completely different palette, and it kind of is. Um, I've been using a lot of primary colors in recent years, but uh, we were all home for three years, and I kind of, something shifted in my work. I now paint a little bit um, looser. I can walk with this, right? I want to show you something over here while that's drying a little bit. Um, I showed this another time here at, at Florida Watercolor, but this is an example. This painting was in the Florida Watercolor show. Um, I don't remember. I think we were in Orlando. I don't remember what year. But this is an example of how I let myself go with a painting here at the top. You might have to come and look at it later, but this one is, a full, is the full sheet. I put that, I took a photo of it, and then I cropped it on my computer, and I got to this, because I knew I didn't need all that. You see how I cropped all that off? Now I have more like a square. And then I was able to go in and just, I, this was too bland right here, so I pulled it up, pulled up the color with that. And do you see how this gray, which was okay for a while in my mind, became a red. See how the hot red, this red and this red were so strong. So I put a little red there and just walked my way around the painting. I do like that white. I probably should have left it, but when you get a chance to look at that up close, this is a really old piece. I did a series, a creation series that had seven pieces and it compared creating that artists do with creation in the Bible. This is the spirit moves because I got this sort of figure here from marbling. Now this is doing an abstract start with that and then I put it, I, I marbleized, I, I floated acrylic on that gel stuff and you just put it down on it and I got that. I was doing a lot of, this was a full sheet though, this is just a print of it. And um, this I did recently in a workshop and I actually entered it in this show but it didn't get in, another one did. Um, and this was, I thought, very abstract, but when I got it home, it became a landscape. So that happens too, you know? And 
the point is it doesn't have to be abstract to be loose, to let go. It can be a realistic painting as well. This is really old. This is 2005. And I brought it because I had a pretty good print <laughs> of it. But um, I still have the painting. This one is just all, you know, I was, I don't know how to explain it, but I wanted you to see that I can put a figure into an abstract, and I think it's more interesting than the figure would be if the whole thing were realistic. I've given her an atmosphere around her, and it sort of looks like, it, she looked like an Indian woman to begin with. She's got something coming over her head and a cloak around her. I painted this for my daughter when she was going through a divorce, and I call it looking for the light, and um, I like it, so. <laughs> Back to those same colors I'm kind of using there, but I just wanted to talk about these a little bit. Up front, you see the one on the left. This is my after Salberg piece, and you're probably going to have to get close to this to actually see it. Um, this has a lot of um, rice paper in it, uh, Anru, the mulberry paper with the strings. And it didn't, I entered it in Florida watercolor last year. It didn't get in Florida, but it got in Southern, and I got my signature this year for this one. But I want you to know that the black that you see in here is India ink, and I tossed it just like I do, like I said Mort Salberg does, where I went like that, you know, and, and then I pulled. Here you can see I pulled out the, the ink with water because when it's still wet, of course, it, it's soluble, and you could pull it. Um, so I had this black frame, which is a nice way to start if you start with something permanent like that. Now you've got to deal with it, and you have to do something interesting. So there's rice paper and there's collage paper in this one. Um, you can see this green is a piece of tissue that I painted, and there's little tissues everywhere. It sort of started to look to me like the sea, and that's why this blue one is here. This is called um, um, By the Tides. I did it again. Uh, tide rushes in, it's called. And I want it to look like the sea is coming in. And the seabird, that was part of my toss. That was part of my throw. He was there, except for I put a little head on top. So the white in the background. There's a lot of gesso. Where? Here? Here. An all white corner. You think it's too much? No, I don't know. No, I. Okay, this goes back to, that's something that, okay, what she just said, what about the white corner? And I have been dinged for that before. But remember how I said I do what I want? <laughs> so I don't always follow the rules. And people who really know me know I'm not very good at following the rules. But um, I mean well. <laughs> um, but I liked a resting place. I think a busy painting that has this much with all these strings and things in it needs a place for you to rest and sort of, it sh this, this whole thing is pointing into this. It's bringing you into the painting and then hopefully the water is bringing you down through. So it, compositionally it worked for me. Yeah. Um, I'll show you that. I have rice paper with me. I'll put it in the painting. This, did I talk about this one already? This is, um, I call it Shangri-La, because if you see, there's a little um, sand pan sitting on the water here. And there's this little shack, like it's in China, maybe. Didn't mean that. I started just, my original stroke was this red going in for a distant mountain. And then I put the blue in, and everything started to drip. And there's some rice paper in this one, if you get up close, and some gold which is kind of a no-no in most shows. But it did get in Florida watercolor. So I don't know if they realized it had gold in it. What? They don't like you to use things like that are already, uh, if it's not gold leaf, it's just gold paint. But if you used gold leaf, it wouldn't be allowed, for sure. It's a watercolor collage, yeah. I guess it has to, it has, you, you know, when I sign it in for a show, I put water media collage for the, what it's called. What subject? 
I think you have to make it work. And I've heard people, I've heard judges say, that's a difficult format. People don't really like to work that way. The same way they don't like to see an X or something that's so uh, static. It's like, it's, it's an open thing, but you've got to make it balance within that shape. That's what I was talking about in format. It's really important. When you start doing an abstract, you think you can just go crazy and put paint all over, but you have to still consider all those design elements. And I don't know why Mark didn't want to say, is he here? I'm about not to. Uh, it looks to me like the color palette colors change. That's what I mean. Really bright to very yeah, I, I, also, I also was very ill for two years during this time, and I thought, yeah, I'm, oh, so you can, so they can see me in the camera. Um, yeah, I was trying, I was going upstairs. Um, I was ill, and I was just at home all the time, and I think I wasn't strong enough to paint, but this was the first one coming back. Maybe that's why I love it, too, you know, when you, when you get excited about something. So, any other questions? Yeah. I painted the woman first. I worked down and, and put the cloak around her, and then that white that you see above her head, that is white acrylic, or I use um, a white ink, um, F and w, FW wing, inks. And, um, she, um, you can kind of see if you come up close to it when we're done. Um, it's, I think that that is, this line right here is my favorite part in the painting almost, um, because I think it's lyrical. I think it gives this whole sw swooping, it, it gets you ready for all that other stuff, you know. And, um, and because it reminds me of my kid, but. Okay, I'm gonna go up front, I mean up top, paint some more. What time is it? Okay. okay, I could paint some more on this. The only thing I was gonna do to this was to show you what happens. Hmm, I guess I didn't bring, what? I didn't keep a clean water. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to show you if I completely change colors on you. So I'm going to, this is dry now, so I can go back over it and wet an area and get a big, this is how sometimes if I get caught up in the small stuff like this one is, I'll go to a big shape to try to break out of that. And I'm going to use red, so don't be scared. Frightened. This is my favorite quinacridone red. It's made by Da Vinci. Don't tell Cheap Joe's I said that, but I do buy them from him. It's just not his colors. So, anyway, it's not red enough. Coming out pink. Okay, I'm ruining it. So sometimes I go in and just link everything together when I get too many small shapes with an over color like this, but I'm losing all my white, so I've got to bring it back. Hope I can. This is why people use white gesso on their paper and don't use regular watercolor paper. I'm painting on Fabriano cold press, which I'm crazy about. And uh, for years I used Winsor Newton because it had a really hard surface that I could count on to hold the paint up long enough for me to get back to it. And um, hold on, I'm gonna just run a bit. It is 300. Or I don't know, I've, it might be 140. Is anybody else having trouble getting paper? I. I ordered paper last month and I had a little trouble getting color I could work 
I mean, that I getting the ones I wanted. I had to try some new kinds, so I'm not even sure. This is Fabriano. No. But I do like to pick up. I like to lift. So um, if you have a, a flat that is um, sort of short like this one instead of long like this, this is a really good wash brush. This is a better lifter. And I know I'm getting an edge right here. And if I'm getting an edge, I usually go back and try to soften it so that leaves it open for more work. Now you see why my apron has paint all over it. But I'm going to go back to my color, my under colors and try to get some of this original design back in. I'm sorry we have such a short amount of time because you're not going to get to see anything really finished. If I could paint a painting in 40 minutes or 50 minutes, it would be super, but I can't. So I lift by, it's really, really wet right now. If I wait just a little bit, it will lift much better because it will start to set. If you look for my paint, if you go to um, Sue Allen Art, um, no, that's not. Uh, Anyway, Sue Allen Art at Verizon.net. I'll, I'll post the finished painting of this, but that didn't really work very well because I'm not. Okay, let me show you another way. <laughs> okay, another thing I do is pour. The red in that painting was done with this. Um, the, well, they took it away. It's covered now, but the the. Uh, or the Asian looking one, the, I call it Shangri-La. This is the same paint I was just using, but it's in a, a squirt bottle and you get a stronger, thank you, you get a stronger effect. And in this case, I wanna spread the paint, but I don't want to um, control it. I want it to stay pretty strong. So I'm, I mean, I am controlling it, but I mean, I don't wanna thin it down. The only reason I'm doing this is to get it stronger. I can't find things. You getting an idea about how these things happen? <laughs> okay, now I might go into this now and lift out like that, or I'm famous for putting saran wrap on it, which I think you all know how to do. But um, you get the idea for the way that I work. I, want to sh I wanted to show you another thing, though, other than just doing an abstract. Did you get enough? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to do that now. OK, I hit the carpet. These things are like sails. They want to go somewhere. OK. Paper towel. Okay, this is the um, paper that I use that you can, I bought mine from Cheap Joe. And I also have tissue, pre-painted tissue. I keep all my scraps so I can add stuff if I want to. This is a painting I did in a workshop. And um, I didn't do anything more to it because we wanted, they wanted something kind of realistic. So I'm gonna show you what I would do to it to, um, make myself happy. I haven't really shown it or anything. It's just been in my file at home. This one has gold acrylic on it, which I love to use. Um, there are all kinds of people that don't approve of it. I had one judge, and because I was on the board for a while, I met a lot of these judges that come to Florida Watercolor, and it was Carla O'Connor, I'll just say that. Um, she said, when she saw a piece that I had gold paint in at a show, she said, and she was the judge, but she said, had I known that there was gold acrylic in that, your painting wouldn't have been in the show. 
it was a good painting, but she doesn't like it. So I, you need to know there are people who have their biases about things like that. And it used to be really horrible to put some acrylic in a watercolor. And I get that too. I mean, you want the competition to be even for everybody. OK, I know. Do the, the other thing. Yeah. No, it's, it's an acrylic. It is metallic. It's metallic. I also use um, these pearlescents, FW pearlescents. And I, I'm particularly fond of this uh, sun up blue. I, you'll probably see it if you look at my paintings carefully. But, and I also brought silver. So the gold, though, is often a tube of acrylic gold. So, but I, I, most of my acrylics are liquid acrylics, so I can get them going really quickly. OK, I'm using GAC 100, but you could use, um, wait, I also have um, Palmer Medium, we called it, but gloss medium, Liquitex gloss medium. Just depends on which one you want. The uh, GAC 100 is a little flatter when it dries than the gloss will be. I used to love gloss, and so I used it quite a bit. But now I like to have it look like the paper disappears. If you want people to not see the paper right away, you want to use a flatter um, medium. This is just acrylic medium. And I want to get an old brush for this, because I, well, relatively old. I didn't bring any real old. But. This painting, I think, needs help. And there's some things I could do, like even now, with it the way it is right now, I could go in and I could rub out places and make it softer, you know, like edges that aren't very good. So you can go in with a watercolor, and especially if you can be patient enough, which I rarely am, to let it sit for a little while. And then, you know, you can soften it quite a bit. And it's not a bad idea if you're trying to lose an edge to do that before you use anything on top of it. But for our purposes today, I'm going to show you what this will, will cover it, will change the whole look of it, but it, um, it doesn't completely hide it because it's transparent. You see, it's so thin. You can buy heavier papers, but I happen to love all that transparency like we talked about. So, OK, now when you put this on, I usually just put it directly where I want it and then paint the top to blend it in. Did you catch that? It's very easy. And it sort of gives you an, it will dry, and then I have a new surface to work on. I can come back in with the same colors, and, but it's, it'll have a different look, and it will complete the composition a little bit more. What am I using for this medium? Acrylic. Have you heard of, uh, like, this is GAC 100. It, it's to mix into your acrylics. And this is uh, gloss medium varnish. Both of those are flat. You can get the, anyway, either one works. Can you paint watercolor over top of that Yeah. Um, if it doesn't go over it, you can use acrylic. But <laughs> OK, I have a hard edge here. So I'm just, while it's still wet, I'm tearing off the edge so that I get a feathered edge right there. And I know you can't see that really. From, can you see the paper? You probably can't see it from there. So let me, let me do a piece of the tissue. I didn't know what colors I would need. And these are pretty strong for that painting. Let me use the blue a little. OK, you see this edge right here that is kind of too strong? I can come in with tissue. You can also put this on and then, and then tear it off so you know exactly, so that you get a more interesting edge. You want to make an interesting shape out of it, and I'm not doing it well because I'm going too fast. Slow down, Sue. This is with acrylic. You can do it with watercolor, but it spreads. It's, it, it'll dry and it'll stay, but then when I, yeah, when I go in it with go into it with the acrylic medium, it will, the color will pull out a little bit with it. Yeah, good idea. Thank you for saying that. 
Okay, so I want to cover up here a little bit. Do I pull it down? Well, that makes it easier for me, too. Thank you. But see, now that didn't blend in very well with that. So I might have to come in. If I'm going to cover that, I have to pick a color, mix a color that's, that works with that. Can you see my palette? Good, because it's messy. Use a clean palette whenever you can. It does make a difference. Your colors are all going to be gray if you don't control them. Oh, I can't get rid of that brown. It's in my blue. This has such fresh colors in it. I wanted to just bring that color up a little more. OK, I can't make it blend perfectly, so I'm going to instead show you how I would. Come on, pull that over. Yeah, you can. White, you mean just leave it white? I don't know who I'm talking to. but See, that brown is just everywhere. I should never put the sienna on there. Okay. I'm going to quinacridone gold, which is the answer for everything, right? GAC 100. GAC-100. Who makes it? Um, Golden. Um, there was something else I thought of. Oh, what I haven't shown you, too, is that I, I use white. And the FW white, a lot of times when you see in my work, like see the stream over there, how the waves are coming up? It's this. And I love absolutely love to splatter with it into a wet surface. I, what, what's the question? Oh, FW. Yeah, it's acrylic ink. And I buy it in big bottles because I use it so much, but... Um, it's an acrylic ink. So anyway, you can see that you can take an old painting like this and you can jazz it up. And now it's moving toward abstraction, but this doesn't look good because it's too heavy. I should have brought a different piece of, of paper. So I'll just paint over it. <laughs> Honestly, that brown is getting into everything. OK, any more questions? I'm a little bit uh, angry at it right now. <laughs> That's a nice, friendly thing to say. I react to what I, my starts. Um, although I have to say that since I, I've changed my like the painting down there. I've, I'm more interested in painting the sea and landscapes now 
than I was before. I'm not so into abstract as much anymore, and it's a little hard for me now to get back into. The thing about abstraction is people think it's easy, but it's actually much more difficult because you don't really have anything to look at. And I'm reacting to what I just did all the time. Um, and sometimes it's horrible, so you have to be prepared to make those corrections or make it work. It, often you can just put more layers on, but then you lose your transparency, your beautiful, the things you love about watercolor. And that's disappointing, but thank you for that question. Um, I'm so um, more introverted now. I'm thinking about family more. I'm not so much into the painting as I was. I'm recovering from an illness, and I just um, don't have a lot of strength for it. Do all of you feel like when you're working, do you just pound it? Like, right now I'm perspiring just from working in front of you guys. It's like I put a lot of emphasis into it. So. Um, I hope I helped you get, what, what did you want to get today? Somebody tell me what you were looking for about letting loose with watercolor, with water media. You know that you can mix your acrylics with your watercolor. I brought only a limited number of colors in acrylic, but if I want to make orange out of this red, I can use my yellow watercolor into it. So if you want to play, how many of you use acrylic already in your water paintings? Okay, so you know. I want to show you this color. Maybe you can see it if I do a big blotch of it somewhere. This is the Sun Up Blue. F see how it is iridescent, and it goes with all this up here. So that's why I wanted to get into it. But. And this is an acrylic ink, so it has a body that you have to consider. It's, um, it has its own strength and shapes when you put it down. Or you can put a lot of water with it and it blends away. Back in the day I was telling you about going to college in the 60s, acrylics were, had just come in and that's all we were supposed to use in some of my freshman classes. And they were awful. Does anybody, did anybody use acrylic in the 60s and they were just, they were just marginal, right? It, you didn't know whether they were, they were transparent when you wanted them to be opaque, and they were opaque when you wanted them to be trans. I, I don't think it was just because I couldn't handle it. They were really. But now, I just think they're wonderful. This has a flow to it all on its own that the paint just kind of did. Um, you know that saying about if you get out of the way, the painting will make itself. That happens a lot with this kind of thing. And then if you make a mistake and you get white on top of something you wanted to keep, like this purple, you, you can lift as long as it's wet. If you're having trouble get adjusting to using water, um, acrylic, that would probably be the hardest thing to adjust to, would be realizing that you can't lift it or change it once it starts, once it's dry, it's permanent. But that's also an advantage. Remember how I told you how I threw the black ink on that one to get started? I think if you did the same thing with a black acrylic or you did it with any shade of acrylic as an underpainting, it would always be there, no matter what you do to it beyond that. I see some puzzled looks on people's faces. I'll be glad to help you any more I can. More questions? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Let me get another piece of paper. Here's my portfolio. I'm going to show you on a smaller piece. Okay, is that in the position where you can see it? And this is the rice paper, so it's going to disappear when it's on there. But when I paint on it, you'll be able to see. Because I'm going to paint on it right away, and I don't want it to be wet when I do it, I'm going to put the, the um, medium on the back of it. And um, I'm looking for an older brush. You don't want to use your best brushes with this GAC or with the... Um, any of the mediums because they don't come out of your brushes very well. 
So off of the, pa off, off of the watercolor paper, I'm going to put this stuff on the back of a piece of the rice paper. I'm putting on the back GAC 100, but you could also use acrylic medium varnish. Okay, I'm putting that down now. It picked up some black from the table. But then I would do um, use a brayer to go over it to settle it in. And see, the edges aren't going down. Um, it's really important if you're going to do this sort of thing that you get your edges down. You don't want feathering all around flopping up on you. So be a little bit responsible about that. Don't. So I'm going to have to come back and add it along the edges. And now there's red in here. Man, I'm having trouble with a dirty palette today. Okay, that's not going to work because see, it's all covered with black now from this table. All right, all right. So now I'm going to paint a color over it. In fact, I should probably use the brayer for that too, but I'll use a soft brush. What color should we make it? I want to use the blue. Watercolor. But acrylic would work too. But you got it. What? It does. You can see it that well. That's great. <laughs> okay, now can you see how it's gathering onto those strings that are in the rice paper? If I go out the edges, you'll be able to, outside of the edges of the rice paper, you'll be able to see the shape it created. And I see the owl now, so. It's kind of like a cardinal rule in my, <laughs> in my classes. I don't like it when people see something in my painting because then I can't unsee it. <laughs> but, but I see the owl. I'm not mad. I'm <laughs> just saying. Be careful when you say that to artists who are just doing their own thing because then you can't see. You see that's the rice paper and the texture it makes. Let me hold it up. You see it well. Okay, so if I were going to make an owl out of that, I'd have to use a pencil or something. I can't just paint it, but let me see. On the what? You can do that, yeah. This one I just did specially for her because she wanted to see it what happens with this, but um, see if I add a little brown to him and I give him a wing. <laughs> Let's darken it up a little bit. It's time for me to quit, y'all, but it's Kathy Durden's turn. Is Kathy in here? Yeah. Kathy, when do you start? Oh, I do? Okay. Um, I haven't. No. I know. I know about masa paper, and it's it's good for drawing, and and it's very good for calligraphy and stuff like that, right? Um, and I have a book. Gosh, I can't think of his name. A guy that did that with a lot of people, you know. I don't know what an owl looks like, do you? So, I had it down for 11.15 and you started at 11.25? I have to be out by 11.25. So, there's your owl. Oh, it's the back of a cat? Yeah, that's cute, too. OK, Al Lady, come up. You can have this one. Kathy doesn't start until 11.50, Sue. I have 
out at 11.25. You don't have that? Yeah, but I thought I, okay. I don't have to be out of here at 11.25? I thought I had to be out. And she said, do a 50-minute thing. Okay, are you paying me for this extra time? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Nobody pays anyway. Okay, what else can I show you? I'll bring the abstract back. How about that? Sue, I had a question about the marbling. It is. Um, it's a little bit north of the middle, and but it is sort of in the middle. But hopefully, the design. It bothers you that it's right there in the middle. Yeah. Well, if you can make things work, it, you can break the rules <laughs> if you think it works. And I sold it, Bonnie, so it must be okay. <laughs> Everything goes right to the little shack. You're right. And you know what happens when you're working abstractly like I was when I started that, is that it, um, uh, I lost my train of thought because I looked at somebody. Um, yeah, a shape was there. There was something there that made me think that is where the little shack, I didn't even think about a shack, and I didn't look at a photograph of a shack. I just put it in there. So you're right. If by all rights I should have like trimmed one side or something like that to make it better, but it was on a canvas. It was on watercolor canvas. Okay. So well that's really ugly now. Look at that big hole in the middle. So it's still really wet. Um, I'm letting them dictate to me to keep on going. <laughs> so, I don't think that can be saved. I loved the start and I ruined it, didn't I? Um, so, Oh, I know what I wanted to show you. Can I show you one more thing? Because I'm doing that, I want to show you what it is like to work on canvas with this stuff. Now, this is just a regular canvas. There is a storm coming. <laughs> So if you go to Michael's when they have the big sales, I have a sponge somewhere. You have to wash, you have to wash it off um, because it has sizing on it if you want watercolor to stick to it. Somebody tell me when I'm done because I thought I was. So I scrub all the sizing off, and you should do the sides as well, but I'm not going to bother with it right now. Um, one of the things that happens in like that red painting there is when you're working on canvas, watercolor canvas is a little less forgiving, but uh, a regular pre-gessoed canvas from a store will allow you to put paint on and lift it completely. It's like working on UPO. And it could be acrylic. It doesn't have to be watercolor. But I'm going to start with watercolor just to show you. Go right over the edge when you're doing that. No. I don't think so. Does anybody know? It's it's not watercolor canvas, so it's okay. 
only things that are meant for water media can be entered in the show. But And if you're doing pouring, if you're doing that thing where you stack up all the things in a cup and you dump it and it makes shapes, these little canvases are great for that. But um, if this were starting to dry, I'd be able to come in and lift. Like, I want, if I want to straighten that edge, see, so often people leave a messy edge like that. And it kind of, kind of bothers me. You would think I'd be the first one that would want a messy edge. But I think when you tidy something up like that, you kind of separate the men from the boys as far as what I would say is like, you see how it flows on the surface so well? And I still have whites. And if I decide I want a white right in here, I just come in and lift it out. A lot of options to this technique. Once again, I'm going back to the flatter brush. Make it reach both directions. But Bonnie, back to your question about the center. You know, you have to satisfy yourself on something like that. Like, I know it's one of the rules. Don't put anything right in the center. And the, the rules about, um, what's, what's it called, thirds or something? The golden. The golden. Mm -hmm. See, nobody taught me that in art school. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that I was supposed to follow those rules, but I've learned them over the years just because most of my students know more about that than I do. But Remember I told you I went to school in the 60s when people didn't follow the rules, so. I, there was an article in the, somewhere I just read an article that said that the cultural shift between 1963 and 69 was tremendous. <laughs> I was right in the middle of it. But, I mean, I really wasn't a crazy person, but it, it was, in the art world, it, was an, it wasn't considered important work unless you were doing something totally original. It was 11.28, am I done? Well, I didn't want to disappoint anybody. Okay. If I had saran wrap, I'd lay it on that wet surface right now, and it would make more shapes for me. And then I'd run my brayer over it. Where did I put my brayer? So thank you for listening.